thermodynamics, heat conduction, and the zeroth law. Questions to ponder. What is heat flow or rate of heat transfer? What is thermal conductivity? What is thermal resistance? And what is the zeroth law of thermodynamics? To understand heat flow or heat transfer, we have this illustration. It shows one body or object over here that goes out, and we're showing it this, it's really huge over here, um, and it's at a particular temperature, T1. We have another body or object over here, which is large also, and it's at a lower temperature, T2. I know it's a lower temperature because we're going to be talking about heat flowing from T1 to T2, or heat transferring through this object right in here, this body right in here that has this cross-sectional area and has this length from here to here. So we're going to transfer heat from one body to another through this material. So we talk about heat flow. Heat flow, we can look at it two ways. We can look at it in the micro sense where we're looking at just the uh, particles here uh, that'll become more energized on this side, bouncing into more particles here and so forth, and eventually transferring the heat over to this other material. So heat flow, H, is given a symbol H, is equal to the change in heat over a period of time. In other words, the rate that heat is flowing from one side to, an other, to another here. That would be the micro concept of heat flow or heat transfer. The macro concept of heat transfer, given the symbol H as well, these two are equivalent when we look at it here, it depends on four things. First of all, it depends on this K called thermal con conductivity. It's a constant thermal conductivity, and it depends on the material here that the heat is flowing through. Uh, that's called thermal conductivity. Um, the area, the cross-sectional area here, is also a factor. Obviously, the greater size of the area here, the more heat uh, can flow. Also, it depends on the difference in temperature from one side to another. The more dramatic the difference in temperature here, the, uh, the greater the heat flow. And then finally, um, there's an inverse variation with length. <clears throat> The longer this material is here, the less uh, the heat flow is. So this is really the equation that we're going to be using in our macro world <coughs> to understand heat flow. Before we leave, though, we have to see that heat flow is in the units of joules per second, heat per time here, uh, or watts. And so uh, watts is probably used a little bit more often. Uh, so heat flow itself is measured in joules per second or more likely measured in watts. Thermal conductivity and materials. Thermal conductivity depends on the type of atom or molecule or material that makes up uh, the, the uh, substance that the heat is being transferred through. And so if we look at these various materials, we'll see that things like copper and aluminum, metals in general, um, are very good conductors of heat. The heat can flow through them very readily or easily. They have a big number here. And so since that's a big number, the heat transfer is going to be large. <clears throat> we can see that other materials like uh, concrete, fiberglass, goose down, polyurethane are poor conductors of heat, um, which could be a good thing. We're going to see on the next slide that that can actually be a good thing because it can provide what we would call thermal resistance or insulation to prevent uh, heat from flowing. Before we move on to that page, though, let's talk about copper and aluminum and thermal conductivity being a good thing as well. If we have a microprocessor like in your computer here, the chip would actually be inside here. You wouldn't be able to see it because it's sealed in here and soldered in place. That chip would come out and these are all these little pins right here, leads coming off of that microprocessor. So these are input output leads 
going to this particular chip. This might actually be a memory chip. But anyway, it's an integrated circuit in here. These get extremely hot because there's a ton of electrons moving in and out of them super fast. There's an awful lot of electrical energy uh, that needs to be dissipated out of here. And that's the job, if you can see these fins over here, that's the job of these fins on the back side of this, uh, this casing for this circuit. These fins allow air to flow by and to dissipate, the, remove heat from this microprocessor or memory chip or whatever kind of integrated circuit there is in here. So this is a good conductor conducting the heat away from the circuit and then letting uh, air some air flow by to, to take away the, uh, the heat from the microprocessor. In your car, the radiator does that job. The, the typically radiators are made out of copper and uh, the hot uh, coolant comes in the top and flows down th with gravity and also there's a pump, a water pump. But anyway, water pump pumps the, uh, um, well, the cooling liquid through these various uh, tubing that go down through the uh, radiator and there's lots of uh, thin fins here and air gets blown through as a car is moving and then there's usually a, there's a fan that also draws air through when your car is idling in an intersection to keep the air flowing through and uh, pulling away from uh, the copper lines that are going down through the radiator. So this cools your car. Refrigerators have the same kind of a system for them to take the warm air out of the refrigerator and uh, um, cool down the refrigerator. This is uh, an air conditioning unit inside your air conditioning unit at your house. Again, the copper tubing is carrying the um, Freon, which are in these systems. These systems have Freon. So it's carrying the Freon through and uh, <coughs> air goes by these cold uh, lines and uh, gets pumped into your house to cool your house. So surface area you can see here the surface area they're playing with. There's a lot of surface area here, a lot of surface area. So surface area plays a big role uh, in uh, removing heat when you have a uh, high thermal conductivity to create as big of a temperature change as possible. The opposite is true for low thermal conductivity here. In uh, houses you have insulation and in uh, windows you have insulation and styrofoam cups uh, are insulative. They have high thermal resistance and so does down in your down jackets or in your blankets and so does polyurethane and wetsuits. So they all have fiberglass for your house, goose down, polyurethane for wetsuits. They all have high thermal resistance because they have very low thermal conductivity. So thermal resistance, to make something more thermally resistant, you get a material that has very low thermal conductivity and you make it nice and thick. In other words, the distance that uh, the heat has to transfer, the thicker that is. That's why the jackets here are thick. The uh, more thermally resistive they are. That's why windows now aren't single pane. We have a gas in between two panes of windows. Ga a gas is a poor conductor of heat. In other words, it has very low thermal conductivity and therefore it insulates your house. So now it's your chance to do a uh, heat transfer question. A concrete wall is 20 centimeters thick and has thermal conductivity of 0.8 joules per seconds, meet, uh, meters, and degrees Celsius, or Kelvin, this can be Kelvin too, um, because it's a change in temperature that we talk about. That's why it can be either. The wall is 2.6 meters tall and 12 meters wide. That's a pretty big wall. Um, if the temperature outside is 10 degrees Celsius and the temperature inside is 20 degrees Celsius, what is the heat transfer to the environment? And uh, so this could be in watts to watt. Uh, when you get your answer, your answer can be in uh, watts. A little hint here, be careful uh, to convert this to meters first. 
Take a little time, come back when you're ready for the answer. So, how did you do? Uh, we have a concrete wall, it's 20 centimeters thick and has a thermal conductivity of 0.8 joules per second meters degrees Celsius and joules per second could also be represented as a watt like we did down here. The wall is 2.6 meters tall and 12 meters wide so the area of the wall is going to be 2.6 times the uh, 12 meters and then the temperature variation from 22 degrees C inside to 10, degree, 10 degrees C outside is a temperature difference of 12 degrees C. And uh, again, our thickness is 20 centimeters, so that works out to be 0.2 meters to get it in the same units here. So we simply use our uh, heat equation here, our heat transfer equation, and we have our uh, thermal conductivity times the area of the wall, these two, times the uh, temperature difference divided by the distance the heat is transferring, that length of 20 centimeters, 0.2 meters. And that ends up being 1,500 watts. And that's a lot of power, so that's why concrete is not necessarily a good material for thermal insulation. So hopefully you had success on this problem. Before we move on, you could see in this example that heat flowed from higher temperature to a lower temperature in an attempt to uh, get to thermal equilibrium. To understand thermal equilibrium, we need to take a look at the zeroth law of thermodynamics. I really like the zeroth law of thermodynamics because it shows that science is a human process. It shows that it's imperfect. Uh, we had the first and second law of thermodynamics uh, long before we had the zeroth law. And in, in fact, somebody suggested the zeroth law really should come before the first and the second law. So they didn't call it the third law. They went back and called it the zeroth law. So uh, that's what this video is uh, going to explore next. The zeroth law. Uh, if two objects and systems have the same temperature, they are in thermal equilibrium. If, a, if system A is in thermal equilibrium with system B, and system B is in thermal equilibrium with system C, then system A is in thermal equilibrium with system C. Wow, that's a mouthful to basically say that uh, any two objects that have the same temperature are in thermal equilibrium. Uh, so let's start over here. I think visually this is a lot easier to understand. Uh, if we have three substances that we put in contact here, if they were originally not the same temperature, we would have heat flow uh, from a higher temperature to a lower temperature. And uh, eventually, after a little while, these objects would reach thermal equilibrium. In other words, they'd all reach the same temperature. Once they were the same temperature, if I just isolated and looked at a and B in contact together, both being 298 degrees here, or if I just looked at B and C in contact with each other, and they were the same temperature, then I could theorize that A and C would also be in thermal equilibrium. It's uh, not a fancy law, but it does help out an awful lot uh, to understand the first and second uh, laws of thermodynamics, which we'll discover down the road here a little, a little ways. So hopefully you can answer the questions. What is heat flow or rate of heat transfer? What is thermal conductivity? And what is thermal resistance? Oh, of course, and then what is the zeroth law of thermodynamics? Scratch has his parting thought. Well, before you take a rest, I'm glad that you are still striving for continuous improvement.